when you really look deep down and think about how women have been socialized to satisfy the male gaze absolutely it really does present a threat to the intimacy of our relationships with both men and women there is a dehumanization process that a lot of women go through in order to adhere to the male gaze Facts. i'm just trying to find what actually works for me mm. not what's being sold to me being a people pleaser really doesn't afford you the freedom to be somebody that makes choices and decisions about their yeah. lives based on them hello and welcome to the to my sisters podcast i'm courtney and i'm renee and we are your online sisters and hosts of the to my sisters podcast we are all about promoting the wellness growth and development of a community of sisters around the world and in today's episode we're going to be talking about freedom from objectification our relationship with sex Come pornography on. addictions all of that good Come stuff on. as well as can we truly divest from the male, the male. Yes. yes wonderful stuff this is coming off the back of the wonderful episode that my fabulous co-host courtney did with none <laughs> other than the incredible adela afadi this is adela afadi guys aka the great philosopher of our time truly truly Miss social commentary yo thank you so much for gracing the tms pod my goodness i love the experience of listening into the podcast yeah. i was listening i listened to it quite a few times actually nice. guys because you know <laughs> i'm a super <laughs> <laughs> fan and watching my faves you know have a good mm -hmm. conversation was you know just wonderful mm -hmm. but I really really enjoyed the conversation and actually sitting back and really digesting obviously Adela's point mm -hmm. of view also I think you handled the conversation so fantastically Courtney and I think there was some really interesting insights around obviously the male gaze mm -hmm. I think Adela's perspective being a married woman for yeah, some time yeah, now yeah. as well really added some color and flavor very interesting so we wanted to just kind of have some space to really digest the episode talk Dive a little in. bit more about you know the male gaze yeah you know talk about sex talk about our relationship with sex as well and yep. just a few other bits that came as a result of that episode but before we do that we got to sweep the house. Yes, housekeeping announcement. <laughs> well, thing. first things first. If you are here on YouTube, then you didn't see a TMS Hot Takes episode from us. Unfortunately, the video decided to do somehow, somehow. Uh, but we actually discussed in that episode a few tweaks that we were th make, thinking of making to the TMS Hot Takes episode in regards to the video that is posted on YouTube. So we're thinking of fully going audio and letting you guys just focus on the Sunday main episode here on mm -hmm. YouTube. We know that a lot of you do love TMS Hot Takes and so we're not getting rid of it. Absolutely. But we're just thinking to make the flow easier to make this channel a bit easier as well to navigate you guys should just go and tune into the audio you know on apple spotify anywhere you can listen to podcasts mm. you can listen to us it's giving podcasts first yeah let us know what you think let us know how you feel about that us moving the midweek just to audio only um yeah that's one element of things yeah second round of housekeeping is we are still raising funds for the bright future yes, academy yes, 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 yes. you may have seen some things across our socials actually just an update on how the project is going thank you all so much for supporting our school school building projects if you don't know if you're new around here if this is the first episode on you are Welcome. tapping on to my sisters this sisterhood is building a school in the northern region of ghana in tamale in collaboration with nguvu foundation yes. and we've been doing that for the last like one year and by everyone's generosity we've been able to fundraise over ten thousand pounds towards this project and we are continuing to raise funds to complete it to do things like furnishing fund staff and stuff like that and so we have the link in the description. We Come also have now. it in the show notes if you're listening to the audio streaming platforms. Um, and we would love if you guys would be so generous as to continue to support this project. It is truly changing lives for women, their children, providing a free quality education and free childcare as well. And so, yeah, help us to change the world for women by continuing to be a part of that. All the information is down below and you'll be hearing more and more updates from us coming soon. So make sure that you're following the Two My Sisters podcast on every platform. Every. And also make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel Thank as well. You. Anything else to say? Mm, I think that's pretty much it. Aside from those of you that have not already bought the book, the two more sisters oh, book, or not? suggest that you buy it. Why not? We have been getting such incredible reviews yeah. and this is not us tooting our own horn. Obviously we'd love to toot our own horn and whatnot <laughs> because we spent so much time and it really was a true labor of love mm -hmm. for us creating this book. 
But for those of you that are new or perhaps those of you that have not actually purchased a copy, I would highly recommend it, especially if you are interested in investing in your female friendships, your platonic friendships, really understanding and diving deep into how to be a good friend as well as how to identify good friends. That is the book for you. And this is a book that you can get for your sister. It's a book that you can get for anybody in your community that is interested in the same. So if you want to do one act of investing in yourself and also investing in a sister, Mm -hmm. listen, go get that book. It's available on Amazon. The girlies are raving about it there as well. Mm -hmm. It's giving, you know, 4.7 on the ratings, which (laughs) means we're doing something correctly. And uh, thank you so much to everyone who has read the book, who has bought the book, who has been giving us such incredible reviews. We appreciate you. We love you so, so much. But everybody else, please, please, please be a part of the movement. Grab your your copy. copy. Get your copy. Get it like a tap. But without further ado, we are going to jump straight into the ding, ding, ding. Dilemma. The girlies need help. We are here. Hi, sisters. Hey, sweet. I hope you're doing well. We're good. Thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, yeah you know, Thank you quite, well. quite kind. Um, here's my dilemma. But mm-hmm. first, let me give you some backstory. Mm-hmm. My friend and I have been besties since 2016. Mm-hmm. We have always had a rocky friendship, but we've managed mm-hmm. to make it work. During our first year at university in 2019, we had our biggest falling out ever and didn't speak for two years. Mm. We rekindled our friendship last year. And although we've had disagreements here and there, nothing serious has come between us. Now onto the dilemma. She's getting married in the summer and has asked me to be her maid of honor. I gladly agreed and we discussed the budget, agreeing on all the expenses I would cover to be a part of her bridal party. Mm -hmm. However, a few weeks ago, she informed me that I would need to increase my budget by five times because the dress she chose for me is very expensive. Hmm. I expressed to her multiple times that I cannot afford the dress Mm. and I kindly asked if she could choose a a cheaper one because it's simply out of my budget. Mm -hmm. Her response was that she wouldn't change it and that I'm always broke. Oh, no. After that, I told her I wouldn't be able to attend her wedding because it's way over my budget. We had a big argument and we haven't spoken since. I'm heartbroken by this because given our history, we may never speak again. Mm. I also feel terrible that I can't make it to her wedding, Mm. but I believe she was unreasonable in choosing such an expensive dress. I don't know what to do. Can you please advise? Love you both. Oh, really sorry that you were going through this. It's really sad when a time of celebration um, or that's meant to be filled with celebration, your best friend is getting married, you're her maid of honor, Mm. turns into a point of contention and reveals some hurtful things about maybe your friend's behavior about your relationship with her and I can imagine it's extremely stressful feels very unfair and feels almost like you're grieving a core memory that could have been birthed from this whole experience so really sorry that you were going through this now I think what you've identified quite plainly in um, your email is your friend is being quite unreasonable Mm. I understand that of course this is her wedding hopefully you only get married once she wants it to be perfect in her eyes everything that she wants but I do think that to have set a budget with you then to expand that budget by such a large amount Mm -hmm. like 5xing it and then proceeding to insult you when you actually raised a very valid point which is this is not how much I budgeted for and I simply can't afford it I think that's extremely mean and very unwarranted and unfair towards you and whilst wedding prep can be very you know stressful and there's that stereotype about the bridezilla and somebody who's you know just so tunnel visioned on what they want that everyone else has to get out of their way I think it's very unfair for her to have called you out like that for her to have spoken to you like that as well as try to force something on you which just is not manageable I think Mm. as a friend if you want to change something especially pertaining to a budget I think it's worth engaging in a conversation which is can you make it stretch and if your friend tells you no like 5x is ridiculous Mm -hmm. coming to a place of compromise but also then maybe offering okay you know what I will cover the difference because obviously this is not what we discussed. Mm -hmm. This is something that I really want and it's unfair to kind of force it onto you. So if this is something that I want to be a part of my vision, I'm going to have to cover the cost. Mm -hmm. I think demanding you to cover a cost, which is unexpected. And also let's be real. Everyone needs to cut their coat according to their size. If you've allocated your budget towards something, I get wanting to make your friend happy and be a part of her big day, but you're doing your part. And I think it's just 
unfair it's unfair pressure and an, it's an unrealistic expectation for you to just say yes to something which was completely unforeseen and so I think your friend is out of order I think if your friend really wants you to be a part of this day she should cover the difference of the dress but I think to be very honest her reaction and her calling you broke and all of that stuff yep. has gone too far I think if you can mend your relationship try to but personally for me I think you've done the right thing and being like you know what? I'm gonna have to sit this one out mm. I would still love to celebrate you I would still love to attend your wedding if that's even possible because I know this can make things extremely awkward going from being a maid of honor to maybe just a normal bridesmaid yeah. or just a normal attendee or not being there at all but I don't think it's entirely your fault I think verbalizing to your friend I know wedding prep can be really stressful. Mm. I really want to be a part of this journey. I am here to help you as your friend, but I really didn't appreciate the way that you handled my response, my very valid response to not being able to afford this stress. I have my budget and I can't, I can't keep stretching it. Would you still like me to be a part of this process? Mm. If she welcomes you in, go ahead. If she does not take it for what it is, take the step back I think she will later go on to regret it but I do think that boundaries are important I think respect is important even in moments of stress or high intensity yeah. and I think you're not the one who's damaging your relationship here her reaction is and so you're well within your right to take a step back for your own sanity and it sounds like there's also been a history of just a rocky relationship maybe lack of communication mm. or lack of conflict resolution or healthy conflict resolution and I think it's worth also addressing that like okay we have not had a rocky situation for a couple of years but I really felt like this brought up maybe some old feelings or I'm yeah. trying to understand why you behave like that yeah. and if our friendship is something that is worth fighting for for you if the answer is yes then you both have to do that work together if the answer is no then take it for what it is but I genuinely think your friend is being unreasonable I think that because of the season that she's in preparing for marriage, I don't know if it's this summer or next summer, but it may be quite close. It may be that she doesn't want to engage in this conversation now. And that's fair enough. But I would not then put myself in a position to just act as though everything is fine. Um, for the sake of keeping peace because she's in a stressful situ situation. Yeah. I would take a step back and be like, okay, maybe I'm not the right maid of honor for you. And that's okay. I guess like that. I'll have to pull out and then we can pick up this conversation at a later stage. But I don't want to be in a position where I'm being maybe um, unappreciated or I feel like I'm being disrespected. Mm -hmm. And I think that's th that's an adult conversation to be had. So yeah, bring up, are you going to pay for the difference for the dress mm -hmm. for me? If not, I'm going to have to be relegated down to a bridesmaid or an <laughs> attendee or an unattendee um and would you like to have a conversation about the state of our friendship now or do you want to wait till after your wedding and then go proceed from there I think being very clear cut with the questions that you ask mm. expressing exactly how you feel will let you know exactly how to move forward don't harbor these feelings within you but express them um with empathy you know she may be extremely stressed um but also just express them very clearly without being ac accusatory um but while still being honest and vulnerable. And hopefully your friend has in their mind that you are yes. their friend and wants to recover this relationship with you and also apologizes for what she said as well. Um, because I, I think that's completely out of line and mm. extremely disrespectful. And I think it lets you know exactly what she thinks about you. And in that case, when somebody shows you who they are, what did Miss Oprah say? Believe them. Hello. You need to believe that she thinks you're the broke friend. Why do you want a broke friend as your maid of honor? I'm going to take a step back mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. keep on, keep it moving. I'm wishing you all the best. I'm going to send you your toaster and a nice <laughs> card. I hope your marriage Matching is fruitful. Kettle. And uh, I'm going to back out. This is all my money can afford. And then I'll move on with, with life. Grieve the friendship um, or the intimacy of the friendship and just keep it moving, man. Mm. What do you think, Renee? No, I completely agree, man. There's a lot going on there. And it's I think much. the level of disrespect even in the way that she articulated her obviously discontent, she was upset at the situation, but to say, you know, you're always broke. It's really given a little bit of unresolved resentment there that needs to be addressed on her part. Absolutely nothing mm. to do with you. Mm. And I think also another red flag is how can you decide and agree? There was, there was agreement between you two on a particular budget on, you know, how things were going to be, especially you being made of honor. Mm -hmm. 
And then to just decide, actually, I want to do something different without consulting you. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, not a, can you do this? It was more of a, it, from, from your dilemma, it sounds like it was more of a dictation that mm -hmm. I would like to, you to get this dress, which is five times more expensive. Mm -hmm. And five times more expensive is expensive. Five <laughs> listen, five times anything. <laughs> it's too much, especially something that's already expensive. Being that's a maid already... of honor is not a cheap, it's not it's a cheap pricey. position. It's pricey. And Costly. I just, yeah, that in combination with the fact that she's gone back on the agreement that you had prior, yeah. I think is a massive red flag and something that needs to be raised. I definitely agree with you in that it is very much about timing. Do you want to do this now or do you want to do this later? It's very much up to you. And I can imagine that she is probably in a very stressful yeah. point right now, you know, preparing to be a wife, preparing for marriage. There is a whole lot of warfare that a lot yeah. of people encounter in the lead up to getting married. So I can appreciate that, you know, she may be under incredible amounts of pressure, mm -hmm. but that does not justify disrespect. At and it all. also doesn't justify the way that she articulated herself to you, mm -hmm. especially because you guys have a history of having a rocky relationship mm -hmm. and you're actively in the process of trying to rebuild hence her you know picking you to be made of honor hence you actively trying to you know be a part of this process for her and trying to actually support her so i think the disrespect was incredibly unwarranted and the expectation that you should go above and beyond doesn't mean that you should violate your boundaries, Absolutely. especially if it is threatening or causing harm to your finances, your mental he health and well-being. Like that's just toxic and very unhealthy. And I think as friends, there should be space for you to articulate your boundaries, mm -hmm. but also to enforce them. Mm -hmm. And this is the opportunity for you to enforce that boundary. Oh, Babe, yeah. me not have money. I'm sorry. Love you. You already know my situation. And I think the fact that she said you're always broke, she probably actually already knows your financial situation. But the fact that she's kind of regurgitated it to you in that way yeah. is just so incredibly unempathetic. Listen, it's a cost of living crisis. A lot of people are going through different things. And as Courtney said, cut your clothes according What's to your, your size. size. Oh my, and if this is not your size, then it's okay. And but. I think even the fact that you said, look, babe, I love you, but if, being the maid of honor means that I'm going to have to do this, then I will respectfully bow out because I can't meet your exactly. requirements. And I think that there is honor in that. Absolutely. Like, rather than you killing yourself or going through all sorts of, you know, you don't also don't, you also don't want her to enter into this season with your friendship with so much resentment. Yeah. And I think it's, it's admirable. There's a lot of courage in being able to own up and say, look, I don't got it like that right yeah. now. I'm happy for you to choose somebody else. If this is the requirement to be your maid of honor, I don't think that I have that right now. Yeah. And, you know, I'm happy to be a bridesmaid. I'm happy to be a flower girl. I'm happy to just attend. <laughs> or if it is so, you know, important to you, I'm happy to also not attend. Yes. Right. Because yeah. if she perceives it as this level of disrespect, then child, it's okay to take I a step back. I don't need to be there. You know what I'm saying? I you don't want to harbor uh, rain on your parade. Is there, you know what? <laughs> you parade, baby. Mm -mm, go have you a parade. Please, 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 please. <laughs> um, uh, God, I, I have things to do. I stay home. I save money. Um, uh, yeah. I and, go about my day. And listen, we get it. It's that season where we have to make some very important decisions, decisions. especially how we spend our money. Facts. And if you don't go it like that, you don't go it like that. So sis, I really, I really do feel for you. My heart really does go out for you because it is awkward. It is uncomfortable. And it seems that you're really trying to fight for this relationship. Yeah. But I think sometimes it's better for you to fight for a relationship off the battlefield. I think sometimes we always think that we need to be tussling and fighting to, to and really be engaging in active warfare to feel like we are trying to mend or doing active work related to relationship building. And sometimes the best thing that you can do for a relationship is take a step back. Simple as. Take a step back, baby. Like, yeah. ah, this one is even frazzling your mind. This ah, <laughs> rocky relationship, rocky yeah. friendship. Ah, this one that you guys took a, obviously, you know, you're in the process of mending this, but you took a step back for two years. It's really given there's a history of yeah. some kind of issues that may be unresolved. Exactly. So I think, baby, take a step back take right now. Take a step now. back. No, 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 no. And this conversation as well about the like cost of being a bridesmaid, Jeez. cost of being part of a bridal party has been really popular on social media right now, actually. And I think on a really practical level, I know that if you, for the bride side. Yeah. This is probably the day you've been dreaming about, right? And you have all of these ideas and all of these th things that you've seen that you want to execute, which costs money. I think the most respectful thing to do is just to give your bridal party, whether it be a bridesmaid, a maid of honor, whatever, enough time to prepare. Let's be serious. This day is for you. Yeah. I'm the one who's footing the bill. 
for to be a part of that I think it's just common courtesy to be like, listen, this is how much it's going to cost. I want to give you enough time to actually plan towards, you know, getting yourself together, budgeting towards this. Let me know, is this something you can afford? And I think it's important to prepare your heart to not take offense Mm. if someone says, I cannot do it yeah, right yeah. it's not that they're trying to destroy your day in fact <laughs> it's them trying to give you less headache yeah. i don't want to commit to something that i really can't show up for yeah. and i think really and truly if these are like your group of friends and you're asking them to do something which objectively is a little bit ridiculous obviously everyone knows their fine their friends financial situations mm. as much as you may not know exactly how much your friend earns you can see from certain signs yeah, like there uh, will be signs, me maybe. asking you to pay five six k to do something is out of my yep. mind <laughs> absolutely out of my mind and also reflecting on your own personal circumstance as well yep. just because i'm the bride doesn't mean i can't empathize with people in the maid of honor or bridesmaid position if somebody asked me to pay this much to be a part of their bridal party would I be outraged most likely so why should you now ask (laughs) why would you now ask other people because people are out here making very wild demands and I'm not I think you're it's it's down to you yeah and your values whether you expect your bridal party to foot the bill or whether you want to foot the bill for them yeah but I do think to be reasonable if you're asking them to do something outlandish or maybe you've added something last minute to the budget that's crazy be like i'm gonna cover it i i just think that's common courtesy i want this to be a part of my day i'm going to cover it because this isn't something that we discussed do you get what i mean it's crazy once you've discussed it and you've agreed on it it's common courtesy in any agreement any additional thing is going to be at my inconvenience because this was not agreed on Mm -hmm. and i think you should take that um you should take that approach as well. I also think there's this this culture of having to keep the bride happy, but you as the bride also have to maintain your relationships with your bridal party. You obviously mean something to them, which is why they're participating in this way, but they also mean something to you, which is why you've asked them. And so don't, don't cause offense. Like, I think that's, that's the thing. Like people can sometimes take liberties and be like, but it's my day. Okay. It doesn't give you permission to behave badly. Ah, because that's how people end up after their wedding losing friends and then they go and sit on a podcast being like oh my friends weren't happy for me i discovered my enemies jealousy Jealousy. um god answered my prayers when i asked him to remove people no you were removed you were removed (laughs) from their life (laughs) because you were clearly a problem and so i'm not saying things don't get tense things don't get heated but be you know gracious Mm -hmm. be humble as well in terms of like apologize when you've said something wrong or in the heat of the moment and really honor your friends as well because this is a moment for all of you this is something that they want to do in honor of you Mm -hmm. and so don't um don't frustrate them either Mm. because they're trying not to frustrate you don't use them as like a punching bag essentially right this is an experience for all of you so I just think this whole conversation is one about wisdom but it's also about love and compassion and understanding um when it comes to dealing with your bridal party because some of y'all are moving crazy truly and also like anyways that's a separate conversation around like you know weddings the the business complex that is weddings Weddings. and the societal pressures that it puts on so many people yeah both the bride but also the bridal party thinking about weddings and guess just how capitalism has really entrenched itself within and it's the wedding it industry. <laughs> it's making it very difficult. These it's days you get invited to a wedding, you know, this thing Omar, is gonna cost me two bills. Omar. It's gonna cost me about 200 pounds to participate in this. Even I would rather gift you this money. And no, no, no. I truly, would rather gift truly, you this money. Because it'll actually mean more to you. Facts. You'll actually be able to pay for certain because I know the expenses for your wedding is Crazy. already anyway, sure. We give God glory and Hallelujah. we pray for everybody that is currently in wedding season, yeah. whether you are a bride, a groom, part of the bridal party, the groom's party, whether you are a mere wedding guest with <laughs> the stress and strain of having to pay for various things. We yeah. pray that God provides for you. Amen. But sis, we are sending lots and lots of love to you. We hope that wisdom will reign in this situation, yes, but we ma'am. also pray for peace in that situation yes, too ma'am. and peace of mind for you. Amen. 
Moving on into the meat and the bones Let's of get the into conversation. It. So, as I mentioned at the start of this episode, I absolutely adored the conversation. I think what really struck me was just, first of all, how down to earth and lovely Adela is. A babe. Just a great babe. Oh my gosh. You know that bit where she was like, you guys are so bright. I said, <laughs> oh, babe. <laughs> You're brighter. You know, love it. It's giving light of the world. I yeah, love that. But also what I really enjoyed was the conversation on the pervasiveness of the male gaze mm. because for all intents and purposes you look at somebody like Adela or a whole bunch of other people mm-hmm. right that may be married or they're at a different stage in their relationship mm-hmm. and I think the that so oftentimes we think that because you're at a particular stage mm-hmm. certain things won't affect you anymore mm-hmm. right so especially for women the narrative that marriage is the end destination Mm -hmm. or the end goal once you have your man or once you're there like you're good you're set you've been prepped you've been primed for this so things like the male gaze don't really you know harm you they're not really something that will be affecting you and I was really struck by the fact that there there isn't a place that you get to in your relationships or within your dynamic where things stop affecting you. In fact, your relationship to sex, your relationship to the male gaze, your relationship to patriarchy actually continue to have an active role in your marriages, in your relationships. And if you don't, you know, put a handle on it, if you don't identify where it's coming from, then it can ostensibly go on to ruin your relationships or color the way that you think about men or your husband or people within your family. So I actually wanted to start with the dangers of the male gaze. Mm. I mean, oftentimes we think about it from, you know, the perspective of being just like women and occupying space as women right now. But thinking more broadly around the male gaze, this idea that women are being objectified specifically for the consumption of predominantly heterosexual men. What are some of the dangers, both the ones that are more known and then Mm. some of the ones that are a bit lesser known for women that are under the male gaze? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one thing that Adela identified around like pick meism and stuff is sometimes in order to satisfy the male gaze or feel like you're positioning yourself correctly to be chosen and to be liked and to receive affirmation from men and approval, you can go to the extremes of really displaying harmful behavior particularly towards women Mm -hmm. or to yourself right in order to achieve that so for example degrading other women insulting other women or seeing other women as competition and your whole worldview being framed by that as like ah, I can't maybe develop intimate relationships with other women because they are a threat to my position Mm -hmm. within the patriarchal system that I'm living in or I can't really um appreciate other women or appreciate their difference or appreciate my beauty or even defend other women who have been victims to a patriarchal society so I think that's one of the main like um dangers of it women denounce their allyship from Mm, other women that's good um and I think that that just in general impacts things like female friendships sisterhood Mm, sisterhood mm, like relationships mm, but also mm, politically mm. um it really does damage family ties as well I think when we look at intergenerationally a lot of the work the male gaze and patriarchal standards and all of that has been a roadblock between mother-daughter relationships for a long time and you know people using when you get to your husband's house, are you going to do that? It makes you feel as though your mum or your your caregiver who is, you know, the female influence in your life is more dedicated to men being satisfied with you yep, than yep. you feeling safe or your development or your well-being. Um, and so I just think it really can be a big roadblock and obstacle when it comes to female relationships of mm-hmm. any kind. Mm-hmm. I also think that it does make your view of yourself a little bit dangerous in that you're constantly trying to fit yourself into a mold you're constantly trying to think of okay what's popular right now what do men say that they like what do men say that they want and in order to be that person I'm willing to go to certain extremes um not just in my participation with other women but in the way that I conduct myself in the way that I change myself in the way that I navigate my personal development journey and that can just be quite unhealthy because Mm -hmm. whilst it can seem like no I'm just becoming the person I want to be the person that you want to be constantly changes with the trends of the times. And I think we've discussed that a lot recently, which is, you know, that tendency for people pleasing, 
will never lead you to feeling fully confident and secure in yourself. Absolutely. Your entire self-worth is now dependent on men's approval, men liking you and desiring you. And as we've seen through social trends, that constantly changes. Yeah. And so we need to be careful to put our confidence and our insecurity or our, our security in something which is so unstable and can make us insecure in return. Okay. Um, I think another danger of it is never being satisfied with the partner that you have, mm-hmm. right? And I think what um, Adela so was was able to so beautifully illustrate yep. was that like you were saying being a married woman doesn't exempt you from the consequences of the male gaze and having been trained by that in yeah. society for decades of your life right yeah. and yeah. so when you realize that in your subconscious you're operating from a place which wants men's appro- which wants men's approval and mm-hmm. wants men to like you and you begin to understand love in a different way and desirability in a different way which is framed by the pervasiveness of the male gaze Mm. when you do finally get a man in your life you think that he needs to match up to that desire right which is I want you to want me a specific way and I constantly want to feel loved in a specific way and that love is often akin to lust Mm. right I want you to lust after me I want you to make me feel like this um but even with that Oftentimes one, it's unsat like that your partner can't satisfy that. Right. But also you're still seeking it from men in general. Mm-hmm. And I think that just leads to a feeling of dissatisfaction, maybe, or discontent. Yeah. Not to say this is Adela's um specific example, but yeah. more broadly, I think that can lead to a dissatisfaction with your partner in like, why don't you love me like this? Why don't you, you know, affirm me like this? Why don't you grab me like that? Why don't mm. you? And then there becomes this insidious comparison as well as just the feeling of hmm, constantly question the intimacy in your relationship. Mm. Um, and I just think that that's really dangerous because yep. I think that can make your partner feel as though they're never loving you right, which can be a very dangerous feeling of insecurity within a relationship. I also think it can lead to, like I said, comparison. And I think constantly comparing your partner to, yeah, to an ideal or to a misconception or a stereotype is really dangerous yeah. um, because they will never feel like they are enough. You will never feel like they are enough. And I think that damages your relationship with them Mm. as well. So I think, when you really look deep down and think about how women have been socialized to satisfy the male gaze, Absolutely. it really does present a threat to the intimacy of our relationships with both men and women as we journey through life with them. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? No, I completely love that. Very much agree with literally everything you said. It was, it was given comprehensive. I think to really add to the point that you made about basing our confidence and our security on something that is inherently unstable, yeah. right? There is a dehumanization process that a lot of women go through in order to adhere to the male gaze. Facts. We are no longer humans within our own right. We only simply exist to satisfy somebody yeah. else's desires because thinking about the male gaze, it is predominantly about sex. It is about being consumed. It is about being watched. It's about appealing to the desirability of a man. Mm. And to see your entire reality around how we can basically appeal to somebody's capacity to consume, you're basically food, you're basically an object. And I think that really means that for a lot of women, we have incredibly low Mm self-esteem that is masked by our desire to be loved. So many of us are out here dressing certain ways. We are out here speaking certain ways. We are out here changing our entire sense of being so Mm. that we can be consumed and desired Mm. and not existing in our own right. And that's so dangerous because now our personhood is simply based on how much we can be consumed. And not to like rain on the parade of like, for example, OnlyFans or like pornography, ETC. But I do think that these are often platforms and mechanisms which exist to, again, reinforce that the male gaze is important and to reinforce that women are being seen as objects because when i think of even the consumption rates of things like pornography or OnlyFans or a lot of these platforms where women are the predominant producers the majority of the consumers are men absolutely and it says something quite unfortunate and upsetting that women can only be viewed by how much they can be consumed Mm. so i think it's very dangerous in that our confidence is now rooted 
predominantly in our capacity to be consumed. Yeah. And I think that there's also a apex and then there's a fall and decline mm-hmm. in that, right? Especially as it pertains to age. So we've got a lot of women Absolutely. who are young and in their prime and think, yeah, I'm sexy, I'm it, I'm do, you know, I am by virtue of existing, I'm desirable. Yes. So there's not that much work that I have to do. Yes. But then the older that you get as a woman, because there is this pervasive narrative in society that you are less desirable the older that you get, mm. you have a lot of women that are trying to beat the punch mm. that are now starting to do things like plastic surgery that they absolutely don't need. Yeah. You have a lot of women that are starting to feel insecure or feeling that their self-worth is starting to shake yeah. because they're less desirable to the male gaze. Yeah. The male gaze, it, you know, it loves youth. It loves this rosiness. It absolutely. loves this you know, if you're below 25, we've all heard the narratives on social media. If you're below 25, then baby, you a spring chick and we love you. (laughs) But the closer and closer you get to To 30, 30, 40, 50, then you are a rooster. Your (laughs) your time is ticking, you got to go. So I think there is something dangerous in that. It gives women a false sense of security and confidence for a very short period of time. And then it tricks women into thinking that I have to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources into chasing that high of the male gaze and male desirability by recapturing my youth absolutely and that is so unfortunate because i've seen so many women obviously there's a lot of women that age fantastically and gracefully and beautifully and i think the key to aging gracefully for a lot of women is understanding that your self-worth and your self-esteem is not in the male gaze. Absolutely. It's not in how much you can be desired by some of these men who by i love you guys but some of y'all anyway (laughs) but understanding that your worth comes from more than that yeah yeah. So I yeah. think it's also dangerous in it gives us confidence only for a short while, but riddles us with insecurities yeah. the moment that we hit specific ages and stages. Yeah. And I love what you were saying about the fact that it really impacts so many other relationships, mm. right? We often think of the male gaze and, oh, it's just about men that we're interested in. It's just about the guys that we're trying to capture as our husbands. Mm. No, it's not. Yeah. It makes us so untenable as friends. Yeah. I love what you were saying about the fact that it makes us competitors to our friends. Because all of a sudden it's about how I can get a man and how, you know, my friend may be stopping me or like making sure that I'm around baddies so I can get a different, specific type of, like how many friendship issues can be rooted or at least have some kind of root in the male gaze, in patriarchy, in, you know, in trying to make us more desirable to men or even mother daughter relationships. I love that you said that because how many of us have quite toxic relationships with our mothers in that's inherently rooted in the fact that our mothers are trying to prepare us to be wives and all that kind of stuff. And how many of us may have, you know, unstable relationships with our brothers, Mm. with our fathers, Mm. because we have this perception of what we think men should Mm. be. And the male gaze is operating over time. Yeah. Dictating the way that we interact with our, with our family. So I do think that the male gaze on a higher level is so dangerous because it's so pervasive yeah. in so, so many of these different relationships. I wanted to add something to that as well. I think what you were saying even about women who age gracefully and beautifully and stuff, I think there is this emphasis placed so much on the external. Right. And obviously we're told that thing of men are visual creatures. And so there is so much peddled to us around how we look, yeah. the aesthetics, the the your face, your skincare, your clothes, your your even your conduct and your etiquette and all of that stuff. There's a lot of emphasis on the superficial. And it's not to say that the superficial isn't important. And one thing I love that Adela highlighted in that um, episode is yeah. reclaiming those superficial things, your fashion, your yes. style, like reclaiming the I way you that. dress as an expression from the inside. And I think women who age, not even just beautifully, but with contentment are people who have realized that the inward is actually what matters yeah. more. So it's me actually working on myself, me allowing my character to be refined, Absolutely. me allowing myself to do these things, even if it is the outward stuff as a reflection of my self care mm-hmm. and how much I appreciate myself, but also going on this journey of life as one where I'm discovering my own uniqueness, my own passions, like really pouring into me. And I think mm. the women who age the happiest yeah. are the women who realize that satisfying the male gaze isn't everything. Mm. It's not the be all and end all of life. There are so many other relationships in the world to cultivate, but also it's a race that can never be won. Absolutely. It's a race that doesn't have a finish line. Moving goalposts. Moving goalposts as well as something that doesn't give you a satisfactory prize, right? 
ending up with that ideal guy still can leave you wanting more out mm-hmm. of life. Absolutely. And I think what the the male gaze and living to sat- satisfy it, what it lies to us is that once we get the guy or once we get that approval, our whole life is made. Like we'll be so perfectly happy. Yeah. And actually I think what a lot of women are um, upset about is the deceit of that, mm-hmm. which is once I do get that, for example, I still now feel an emptiness, which is because my self-esteem is rooted in something external to yeah, me. Yeah. And now that I've achieved that and my life is not over, like I'm not dead, there's actually so much more to do. Like, <laughs> wh- who am I? Now that I've got the ring, who am I? Thank and now me. you're living to be the perfect mother. Yeah. Or now you're living to be, you know, that wife that's always getting the accolades. Oh my gosh, you're such a perfect wife. But it's like, at some point, I think from inside of you comes, but you're still an individual. Yeah. And it's not to say that marriage isn't beautiful, motherhood isn't beautiful. But I think marriage and motherhood are actually strengthened once you know yourself Mm. and once you really have an appreciation for the person who you are outside of those positions and those roles and I think that the women who get the most fulfillment out of life are women who have tapped into that as as young as possible actually women who have divested not because they aren't interested Mm. but because they're not living for it yeah they're not putting their entire hopes on it and now it becomes just a fruit you know whether it be you're pursuing a marriage or a relationship or a life partner whatever it just becomes a fruit of them going on this journey which Mm. was rooted in their Mm self-discovery and their love for themselves and the journey that they're on in life in general and so I think we need to be uh more protective of that actually that like yes I'm on this personal development journey and yes maybe a great fruit of that is me ending up with a partner but that's not the root of it and that's not the sole aim of it either because even once I find the partner my growth will still 100% you think we're just going to be stagnant and static in this relationship you're not you're not what happens you know no I absolutely adore that and I think it really reminds me of what Adela was saying in the conversation around where does this come from, right? Like, and her experimentation with her fashion and the way that... Also, Adela, girl, you and Keith at, um, what was it? Game of of Thrones, House of Dragons. House of Dragons. Did you see my comment? I said, this is fashion. I did not. This is when they Hoots say couture. fashion. This, this is, is what couture. they mean. This ah! is fashion. This is <laughs> this is dressing. Hoots. <laughs> Hoots of the hottest hoots. Hoots couture. I saw that. I said, wow. Hot staffers. Hot staffers. But <laughs> addressing what is the root of a lot of our issues as mm. women and how we present ourselves. Yeah. And I love that you were touching on the internal versus the external. It reminds me of a tweet that I saw fairly recently from Tolly T. Shout out to Tolly T and Audrey hey, on the receipts, the receipts podcast. We love you guys bringing in the receipts. Um, <laughs> but she had tweeted something about how she was starting to feel a lot more comfortable with yeah. herself because she was experimenting with shapes and colors yeah. and she didn't feel like she had to dress a certain way to enhance, you know, her bodily features yeah. or to look slim yeah. or whatever. And to her credit, Tolly, you've been looking fantastic recently. I've been She's looking another fashion, fashion girl. So, oh, fashion chef nice with the hair. You know? Yeah. One thing Tolly does really nicely, everything. actually, which I appreciate. She accessorizes really oh, well. fantastically. Like, oh, Tolly, come yeah, on. Yeah, giving a Tolly to your fan girl, all that kind of stuff. But I wanted to kind of dig deep and talk a little bit more personally about our relationship yeah. with the male gaze and how you think that the male gaze has impacted you and what is your journey of divesting from certain societal but also potentially interpersonal pressures Mm. to look and present yourself in a way yeah for sure it's been an interesting journey i think with desirability politics like anything it's a it's a thing about power it's a thing about in groups out groups it's a thing about who's included and who's not yeah and i think the whole reason why we have this whole like body inclusivity size inclusivity movement is because a lot of people have been excluded from what is considered beautiful or what is considered aspirational um and desirable and so i think for me i've realized that a part of me discovering myself as a woman, a part of me becoming more confident in myself and choosing to live my life to the fullest has been deciding that I'm not living by anyone else's parameters. Yeah. 
whilst certain standards of like clothing especially when we look at like size inclusivity certain yeah. certain clothing certain fashion trends certain um beauty trends may not include my shade my size my shape mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i decide i have decided that when you talk about the definition of beauty it includes me yeah right Come on. and finding myself in that has me- not meant trying to relate to everybody, but genuinely trying to accept myself mm. and not allowing everybody else's criteria to be my criteria for myself and whether I love myself or not. Yeah. So it has looked like, okay, the goal isn't necessarily to be included in this trend. The goal is to feel beautiful or the goal is to feel confident in my wardrobe the yeah. goal is to feel like i'm happy walking outside without a full face of makeup on the mm. goal is loving my hair in whatever state it, it is the goal is not the trend the goal is the feeling mm. that the trend promises to give you air quotes right oftentimes we're not sh- we're not searching for the thing we're searching for the feeling yeah and the feeling is love the feeling is appreciation the feeling is confidence right and a lot of these things are lying to us that they can give us these things and when we buy into it we just need to buy another thing to chase that feeling it's like trying to get a high all the time literally (laughs) it's like a drug and i think that's the you know the cyclical nature of capitalism it's a machine that churns out insecurities so that you can buy solutions and it continues on that wheel and i think when we realize that what we're chasing is a high, what we're chasing is a particular feeling, we then make our pursuit the feeling versus the method, that Mm -hmm. specific method. Mm -hmm. And so for me, knowing that, okay, I'm trying to feel more confident. I'm trying to feel more bold. I'm trying to feel like I'm comfortable in my own skin Mm -hmm. has shaped my lifestyle choices, my fashion choices, my beauty choices in a healthier way for me. I think it's led to, um, me not over consuming as much and me being like I'm just trying to find what actually works for me Mm. not what's being sold to me I'm trying to find what works for me and I think that I'm going to use the word self-centered or the phrase self-centered but not in the negative way that it's often painted but like you putting your actual unique individual self at the center of your personal development and not other people's goals for you And not seeing that, oh, I'm on a journey to become someone else. Mm. I'm actually on a journey to discover more of me. That frames your personal development journey in such a more healthier Healthier way. way. Because now the methods are not about extracting from you all the bits you don't like, but actually trying to discover the or become the version of you that you do like, right? And so it's not me being like, oh, I hate my stretch marks. Oh, I hate the fact that I'm this side. Uh, No, it's I'm this size. It might be for now. It might be forever. And so because I want to feel confident, what does my wardrobe need to look like for this body that I currently have? Mm -hmm. And if it changes, we'll now be working with that body we will have. But it's not a thing of I hate myself and that's driving the change. The change is being driven by my pursuit of self-discovery and who I am Mm. and who I want to be. Um, And I think that that allows you to just think it doesn't matter about other people's approval of me. It really matters is what I think about me and I don't want to think such negative thoughts I want to actually achieve those feelings and those feelings aren't sitting at the end of or or at a goalpost somewhere Mm -hmm. those feelings Mm -hmm. can actually be present with me right now Mm -hmm. and it can be with me every step of this journey I can choose to evolve confidently it's not that I am evolving towards confidence I'm actually confident now and at every stage of this evolution I will continue to be confident confident. yeah I How about yourself? Self actualization, yeah. self discovery, you know, divesting from the male gaze yeah. and all these lovely terms that we love to use. It's an interesting one. I think when I, where I am right now, I love it for mm-hmm. me. I am, in, I would like to believe that I'm incredibly confident. I'm still learning, mm-hmm. I'm still, you know, changing, divesting, and mm-hmm. all that kind of jazz. I think it was very difficult, me, f- difficult for me in the beginning, mm-hmm. though, because I refused to be honest with myself that the male gaze was having an impact on me. Yeah. I think when I was younger, I used to want to be desired, but because I wasn't honest with myself that that was what I desired or what I wanted, Mm -hmm. then it felt like a blind spot where I was Mm -hmm. making decisions and I was behaving in certain ways, but I hadn't really unearthed what the root was. And the root was I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be desired and I was looking for it and chasing for it in all of the wrong places and spaces. And I was using the wrong methods to obtain what I wanted, which was, as you were mentioning, that feeling. I think 
going for, you know, when I was younger, I wasn't the cutest by mm. society standards. Mm. And I think having that experience became my reality for a very long time mm. where no matter what I did or what I changed because I had that experience as a kid where I wasn't necessarily desirable or desired by men, I used to feel like I would need to do the most in order to be desired even as I grew up. Yeah. So I started, you know, not to say that I was out here on these streets at all, that, you know, that's not, that wasn't my story. But in terms of the way that I would behave, the way that I would, you know, situate myself in rooms, the way that I would feel uncomfortable in certain situations was because I didn't know who I was yeah. and I didn't know what I liked or what I disliked. I didn't have a good conception of who I was as an individual because I was so preoccupied with people pleasing or at least being the most amenable person yeah. in the room, being the most neutral. I think it really touched me and you and um, Adela's conversation around people pleasing yeah. and how being a people pleaser really doesn't afford you the freedom to be somebody that makes choices and decisions about their yeah. lives based on them. Absolutely. And I struggled so much with making decisions about myself because yeah. I was constantly so worried about what would other people think or would this ginger other people, would this make other people uncomfortable, not realizing just how much discomfort it was bringing myself. Like I was never content with myself. I was yeah. constantly, you know, running towards or orienting myself around all of these external goals, not realizing that I needed to do some internal exactly. work. So for me, it really was, first of all, identifying that there was a problem, right. identifying that I was dressing in ways that you know, yeah, I wanted to accentuate my shape a little yeah. bit. Yes, I wanted to be desired. Yes, I wanted to be spoken to by all of these cute men. But even when you do have that, realizing that it's not worth it. These, listen, you'll be wearing, like, listen, you'll be out here looking cute. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you head into the clubs, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, when I was younger, I used to, I hit the clubs, you know what I'm yeah. saying? It was, we had a good time outside and all them things there. But then there's sometimes these moments of like clarity that you mm. have when somebody is talking to you, you're just thinking, ah, you're not normal. Or mm. like, rather, you're not seeing me. Mm. I'm out mm. here. I'm looking good. You're out here. You like me, but you're actually not seeing me. Mm. You're seeing what I represent. You're mm. seeing my body. You're seeing my face. You're saying, oh, this girl is desirable. Maybe she's cute for a night, yeah. but you're not looking at me and thinking, oh, I want to love on her. Mm. I want to see her as a human being. or I want to respect her in you know, the context of a relationship. Yeah. And I realized that was what I wanted, but because I had been so shaped by what um, I was perceiving the world said, you know, if you want to get that, this is how you yeah. need to behave. I was never even getting that. So it really did take a radical shift in my self-perception. Mm. And as you were saying, centering myself, yeah. like deciding, okay, I'm going to be confident no matter the weather. Thanks. I'm going to be happy and content with myself, irrespective of what the environment does or what social media says or my interpersonal relationships do or say. Mm. And funnily enough, it was when I decided to be that person that everything in my life took off. Absolutely. Like my relationships improved massively because I started standing up for myself yeah. in situations I started making conscious decisions that were oriented around myself my values and my happiness and confidence in yeah. myself as opposed to trying to appease the most people as possible Absolutely. and I think even when it comes to like style and dressing and all that kind of stuff I love what you were saying around you know being able to go out with like no makeup mm. or whatever my hair looks like or whatever I remember I really struggled with my natural hair mm. because Guys, you guys may, you probably have seen what my natural hair looks like. It's mm. just this massive puff. <laughs> just puff. I really struggled with it for a long time because growing up, I had like relaxers in my hair and I had, had a lot of like narratives around beauty mm. being and, and desirability being around having straight hair yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And my hair was damaged. Y'all, like mm. when I say my hair was... <laughs> <laughs> you know when you're trying to grow your hair and it's mm. just like mm. by your mm. ears, it does not grow past that. Mm. And um, when I went natural for the first time, I had so much shame mm. around just my natural hair, the way that I looked, that it took me a very, very long time. And it was a very long journey for me to really see myself and actually be comfortable yeah. and confident in myself. And that's just like one example of yeah. how I felt like the male gaze really did a number on Absolutely. me. Just being comfortable in my natural state natural Absolutely. state how my body is presented right yeah. now how my hair grows out of my head if I have acne then I have acne Sha. that's that's actually yeah. how um my natural state is so I think really getting comfortable being in my natural state 
um, existing in my natural state and also understanding what are my likes, my dislikes, yeah. understanding who I am as a person and honoring myself Absolutely. in my natural state too. That's so so it's been a heck of a journey, yeah. but a necessary one. I love that. I really love that. And I think it comes down to, again, like motives, like what are the motivations behind what it is that I am doing? Yeah. And I, I would definitely say like growing up and being, and a bit of an outlier and realizing very quickly that like, no matter how much I run to the extremes of diet culture and, or, you know, sexual liberalism yep. and all of these things, I will never be included because this Correct. thing is constantly shifting. I feel like being an outlier to that degree allowed me to reclaim my own like freedom a lot earlier. Yeah. Because you just realize this is not even worth pursuing it's because not, I never, I actually, time. I'm never picked. Like yeah. it just is what it is. Um, and the people that do pick me, I don't like them. <laughs> Like this is not working. No matter how much God, I'm don't kill me. no, but no matter how much I'm shape shifting and trying to force yeah, myself right. into this waist trainer and going yeah. and doing this extreme diet. And Sorry, the waist trainer era was oh, a crazy no era matter, for us. Do boy. you get what I mean? No matter how much I'm doing that, there are still there is still a lack of approval. And I think once you come to that realization, if you are like more so on the extreme ends of like what beauty standards and beauty culture yeah. says is not acceptable, yeah. the quicker and easier it is to be like, okay, I'm just going to do me and go on that radical journey of self-discovery. And I think of a good example of like being a spinster yeah. as Bridgerton would put yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like once you become the spinster of the family or once you become, she's just going to do what she wants you just fall more and more into that trope Truly. of like, oh, okay. Yeah. If you guys have already <laughs> given me the liberty to be the rebel, I'm just going to keep doing I'm it. Chill. Do you get what I mean? And so I think it's also reframing like, okay, I'm I'm never going to be able to jump on this wave. Yeah. I'm never going to be accepted in this. That's fine. All I can do is cultivate where I am now. Absolutely. And then it allows you to actually do things for you. I think when I started like, when I, I would say my discovery of like just divesting from mm. the male gaze happened when I was about 19, like 18, 19. Yep. And I was just like, this is not even worth it. Like no. boys are dumb. Yep. Boys are dumb. I'm not going to get the sort of mature relationship I Truly. want right now. So let me just do me. And it came with just this it almost felt like a sigh of relief that like, oh, take off. It's like when you take off your waist yeah. trainer and you're just there like, Rah. take off your bra. Do you get what I mean? Day, like this yeah. is divesting from the male gaze and patriarchy Comfy. is actually so comfortable and it feels so much more free. And I'm going to lean into this a bit more. And I think where women can sometimes get um, a bit contentious around this point is like, but yeah. I like taking care of myself and it's good. Like, we're not just saying, oh, being your natural state means putting in no effort. Yeah. Because what's really great is just being able to decide what do I want to do for me? Like, yes, I want to put on that lipstick, but it's because I love the I shade. Like it. It looks and good not on me. because like people it. think that this is it. Do you get what I mean? Or people will look at me and be like, oh, girl, you look so good. Actually, I'm doing this for me. Yeah. And I think once you get to that point of like, I go out and do things because I like it. Yeah. I travel by myself because I like it. Or I go to the library and sit there for hours because I like it. Or I bought this new car i don't care whether the guys think that this is a manly car this is a car that i, I want like or i'm I doing it. this career because i'm good at it like i think allowing yourself to just think i want to be free mm -hmm. just brings you so much more fulfillment in life and i think a lot of women are um they're they're moving around in like a straight jacket because they think that that's how they have to be you yeah. know i need to study this i i can't be too ambitious i can't be too loud yeah. and i can't be who i truly am meant to be i can't walk in my purpose i can't walk in my calling i can't walk in my uniqueness even though the world needs it because yeah. i'm trying to be what people want me to be mm -hmm. and that's not fun like bondage is not fun. Not. Like that kind mm. of that kind of bondage to other people's expectations yeah. and, and standards is really not fun. It takes the fun out of life. And I think a lot of women just want to be free yeah. and they want the funness that comes with freedom and being able to make their own decisions and being able to decide what their own values are and pursue those radically. 
just allow yourself to be free ah, open up sis G- genuinely all of the people that are listening to this right now all of the sisters women specifically women please this is your sign to be free Freedom. literally i would challenge you to over the next week or so find some time you know some quiet time by yourself yeah. and write down what are the things that you like and dislike yeah. who are you as a person like i really want you to spend some time really thinking about meditating on who am i yeah. what do i enjoy doing what this are my boundaries what are some of the things that I want for myself and my life, but also specifically in the present. Cause I think sometimes we can even focus on, ah, oh, this future me yeah, or yeah. this future version of me. Who are you right now? What are your likes, your dislikes? What, you know, sets your soul on fire? What really brings you joy on mm-hmm. a day-to-day basis? And also what are your dislikes? Yeah. What are the things that you want to avoid or some of the things that you are currently avoiding that you don't like? It can be as trivial or as deep as you want, but yeah. it's so important to do that exercise yeah. because when somebody asks you the question, who are you? We don't want you to be stuttering. Mm. We want women to be confident and we want women to feel comfortable yeah. to be able to articulate who they are as people yeah. and what that manifests as nice. in terms of likes and dislikes. Yeah, And I think it's really great that you were talking about that because- would it be a conversation on the male gaze and, you know, desirability without talking about sex mm. and how this can often leak into women's perception of sex, mm. our participation as sexual beings, mm. as well as our kind of relationship with sex and men. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, obviously the goal is to be desired by men, yeah. but then there's also the practical implication of how we participate in sex, yeah. how we have sex. Yeah. So you know, in answer to, I know you've shared this so many times mm. on YouTube and mm-hmm. we've spoken about this at length actually, but I would love to know more about where you currently are with sex. Oh, the okay. male gaze, abstinence and celibacy. Yeah. Also, we know that abstinence and celibacy are two different words. Yeah, they yeah. are used synonymously, interchangeably. right? Interchangeably, synonymously, all that kind of stuff. But we are speaking about abstinence. That is folks that are interested or are not engaging in sexual yeah. activity before mirage yes. but cdb like your relationship with sex right now how it's developed as well yeah. like how certain experiences may have impacted you because i know that um adela had mentioned in the episode as well like how there were certain experiences that mm. really shaped and colored her mm. perception of sex in both her previous relationships but then also her current marriage yeah. so how has sex changed for you over the last few years um massively I think as somebody who was addicted to pornography and had to go through a huge journey of unlearning what sex is and also sex that is sex that is manufactured to satisfy the male male gaze specifically yeah I think for me it stem from one what the sexual agency actually looked like to me and abstinence was a part of that choice and I think a lot of people see abstinence or the choice to be abstinent especially for faith reasons as sexual oppression when actually it can be part of you cultivating your sexual agency absolutely and your you know agency over your own sexuality and one thing I realized for myself was I wanted to have sex that also aimed to satisfy me like this is going for grown grown folks folks. 18 plus 18 plus yeah I wanted (laughs) to have sex that was centered around care yeah like not just use Mm. but care Mm -hmm. I think it's one thing to have something and then use it because you want to exploit it for your own use and your own satisfaction and then another thing to have something which you genuinely care for and that dictates your approach towards it and I wanted to have sex that handled me with care Mm. and that meant addressing my standards for men that meant thinking about what does sex look like and mean to me what is pleasure for me as Mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. and really discovering myself as a person and allowing myself to go on this journey which was if I don't if I don't discover what self, a self-centered approach to self-love is, and, yeah. or if, to be fair for me, if I don't discover what God's love for me, my identity, and also my values are, I'm not going to have sex that's actually pleasing to me. Yeah. I'm not going to have sex that's actually pleasurable. And for me personally, that involved outlining certain boundaries for other people, but also for myself and learning to honor those and yeah. articulate those as well. Um, and getting confident talking about sex. I think one thing that pornography does is riddles you with a lot of shame exactly. and shame births a lot of secrecy and secrecy around sex can be really dangerous because it leads to a lack of sexual education. Yeah. It also leads to you not knowing 
how to have sex or feeling comfortable with the idea of sex mm. and sex itself becomes a shameful thing yep. just because sex may have been considered a taboo in your culture yeah. or even in faith-based circles or in your communities doesn't make sex the act of sex itself a shameful thing mm. sex is beautiful sex mm. is intimacy mm -hmm. sex is worship sex is self-exploration sex is pleasure sex is unity and a re it's a gift like god created sex in such a beautiful way yeah and so what does it mean to discover the beauty in sex for yourself as a woman and i think that the shamefulness that surrounds sex and conversations about it in pornography doesn't allow you to discover that beauty and because a lot of pornography is centered around satisfying the male gaze mm. it makes you as a woman feel as though sex is about pleasuring a man and not about receiving pleasure or feeling pleasure yourself and i did a podcast recently as a feature it's not out yet but when it comes out i'll let you guys know Come on now. i did uh, i was a guest on a podcast called let's talk about sex um hosted by an amazing sex therapist called natalie green my new big sis Come on now. um and the podcast was talking about these very things which is you know intimate relationships and how a lot of us didn't discover how to communicate about sex how to have conversations about sex and then we mm. find ourselves in relationships with men and we don't know how to express our sexual needs because we don't know what they are yeah. and we don't even know that we are allowed to have sexual needs and I think women need to allow themselves to feel and society needs to let women feel less shame yeah. around sex and just because you are abstinent or celibate doesn't mean you need to see sex as a shameful or embarrassing or t a taboo thing. We all need to have conversations about sex from the standpoint of not just how do I give pleasure, mm. but how do I discover what sex is, what it means and how I can feel safe and pleasured by it as well. Yeah. And I think for me, my journey has been that, like discovering what is healthy sex, what is um, my values when it comes to sex, what are my boundaries, what would give me pleasure during sex, what are my ways of communicating about sex as well with my potential partner, like all of these things surround confidence and how confident you feel about sex and how confident you feel about your body and how much you see yourself as an active participant yeah. rather than just a sexual tool yeah. for a man's satisfaction yeah. and so I think my journey has been very progressive and it has been um I guess made better by being surrounded by people who talk about sex freely and who take away that shameful shadow of like sex being a taboo and because you're meant to be you know abstinent and be, because you are abstinent yeah. you shouldn't talk about sex I'm surrounded by amazing friends and older women and people who are so educated about sex and yeah. who are very free in sharing about sexual health and their sexual experiences and overcoming sexual trauma as well I think having those conversations allow us to demystify sex and destigmatize sex and that's been my my journey so far and that's even the story I was telling in the main episode with Adela yeah. that like we met around an event about sex and that. one that she invited me to speak at it was one she was hosting and I really cherish environments like that mm. where women are just allowed to be honest and free and share their experiences and I felt like it's really empowering it's really empowering when even within sisterhood you have conversations about sex mm. and all the facets of it from the most you know laugh laughable and hilarious and trivial to the really deep stuff and yeah. doing that root work around our view of sex so yeah I think my journey has been one about removing the taboo yeah. and I think that's just generally with women's stuff in general like mm -hmm. we're made to feel so much shame around so many things that really are important for us to discuss really? if we are going to live a healthy and happy life yeah so that's been my journey how about yourself no I love that I love that I think very similarly actually i think removing shame decentering this idea that my purity and my virginity yeah. or you know anything like that is attached to my sense of self-worth yeah. and the way that i occupy occupy space in the world i think that for me personally purity culture really did a number in terms of how i navigated the world mm. and felt a sense of self-worth and self-esteem mm using almost like my virginity or my abstinence as a power play or seeing it as something that marked yeah. me as different or something that made me kind of seem more desirable to mm. men when really for me especially being faith-based mm. celibacy abstinence and you know any kind of just discipline around sex is less so about men and more so about my relationship with God Absolutely. and understanding that this is a thing that I'm doing for God and not for man obviously yeah. it impacts the way that I interact with men but I'm not out here you know 
I'm not abstaining for a man. I'm abstaining yeah. because I love God and understanding that there's a distinction between the two. And also there's a gravitas between the two as yeah. well, because when you're abstaining for men, the instability of men means that you're not going to be able to follow that path as consistently. Absolutely. When you're abstaining for God, God is stable. God is kind. God is loving. God is that rock. Yeah. You understand that there is an empowerment that comes through faith-based abstinence yeah. or faith-based um, celibacy that just cannot be comparable to Absolutely. an abstinence that is driven purely by, you know, trying to be desirable to yeah. men. Absolutely. So really understanding why I wanted to be abstinent in the first yeah. place, why I was interested in waiting it was because you know i was developing my relationship with god yeah. and now that i'm at a place where i can confidently say i love god and yeah. the reason that i'm abstaining is because i love god yeah. um so there, there was really that element f of that for me yeah. and then also understanding that i too am a sexual participant yeah. you know i'm not just here to perform i think especially from things like pornography or even conversations with men or you know bad men like genuinely yeah. bad men that see women as objects yeah. you start to internalize that sex is for the pleasure Absolutely. of somebody else that sex is just you being a passive participant and sex is simply a gateway for you being you know a reproducer yeah. and i think also understanding that the consequences of sex are not just to be held by women but also to be held by men as yeah. well so if i am deciding to engage in sex with you like when it comes to using protection when it comes to making decisions exactly. about my sex life this is something that i would need to do confidently with somebody else Absolutely. and that i'm not going to hold the corn for you know potential pregnancies or like anything that can happen as a result of sex it needs to be for me personally understanding that this is a joint decision with the person that i'm having sex with yeah. and i'm not just a I am a free agent, but I'm not just a free agent when it comes to the consequences of uniting my body with somebody else. Absolutely. And then Absolutely. I think also, yeah, really understanding that I too can enjoy sex and it's actually good for me to enjoy sex. Like I'm not just, listen, women, we're not just here to come and be lying down for these men to be nope. using our bodies. I remember having a conversation with a friend and he was basically saying he was a really good, well, he is a really good um, male friend of mine. And he said to me, look, Renee, sex is not just an opportunity for men to masturbate with your body. Exactly. You're not just a sex toy. You're not just a sex toy. So you need to speak up when you are active, you know, you're sexually active, yeah. whether it be in the context of marriage, which we would recommend. Mm -hmm. You need to feel confident enough to A, as you were saying, know what it is that you like yeah. and B, express it to the person without shame without fear without feeling that you are some kind of weirdo or even some kind of sicko for yeah. having sexual urges yeah. i remember i used to feel a bit like oh my gosh am i like a deviant mm. for actually having sexual needs Absolutely. or feeling uncomfortable in expressing that i too as a woman desire sex yeah. and i too as a woman desire good sex and good sex doesn't look like necessarily what we see on pornography or on in the movies yeah. or in the romance books Good sex is when there is an environment of love, when yeah. there's an environment of care and when there's an environment of good communication Absolutely. where we can try some things together, but also it is in, within the safety of covenant. That's, That's like a it. really big thing for me. So yeah, my journey with sex has really been as Kylie Jenner would say, realizing stuff, mm -hmm. you know, realizing mm -hmm. stuff, getting more comfortable. I love, I love what you were saying about actually talking about sex in community yeah. is so important to actually have conversations with your friends that care about you. Like, yo, so it, it, less so, you know, yo, so, so you having sex? Yeah, like, what do yeah, men yeah, do? Yeah. But yeah. more so, what are your parameters of sex? Yeah. What are your experiences? How has this shaped how you perceive sex and yeah. how you participate in sex? And then also having older women as well that actually love, love you and care about you to have the real tea and talk about sex so that you are clued up. And then lastly, educating myself on sex, mm. educating myself on my body, mm -hmm. educating myself on my reproductive system, mm -hmm. educating myself just in general, you know, what are the consequences of sex, yeah. but also what does, how can I prepare myself adequately to have sex Absolutely. when I decide to do that? Um, so, so yeah, important. that's, that's what my journey has looked yeah. like. Sexual education is so important. And like, it's often peer to peer. So you need yeah. to start having conversations with women and men. I like that you highlighted Truly. men, like women and men about sex, which is not centered around like the erotic nature of sex, but yep. genuinely the educative, the relational, like the safety aspect as well, like how to communicate, how to, 
learn about your own sexual health and your reproductive health and all of that. I think a lot of women, because we are denied that agency over our own journeys and that self-discovery, we don't even discover the sexual part of us. Yeah. From our sexual organs to the way our bodies and our body parts even look. Can you imagine? Um, and accepting those and feeling confident with those. So yeah, don't just let the world teach you that sex is about the raunchy, the lustful, the orgasm, the masturbation, the, this, the experience mm-hmm. of sex. Allow sex to become a healthy part of the way you view yourself and allow sex to become a part of your personal development journey not yep. sex the activity sex <laughs> the topic <laughs> sex the topic and i think it's actually mandatory that you should know the names of certain absolutely you know, body parts body and parts organs. your genitalia like absolutely. it's crazy that some of us we're sleeping with men that can't name our body parts yeah. and i think that's that's actually egregious. but then there's a lot of women who can't even do that for themselves that's either. True. and that's i think also if you find that through doing that self-discovery exercise, you discover that there may be a bit of sexual trauma or Mm. a deep, 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 deep shame around talking about sex because you haven't healed from some sexual experiences which were maybe forced onto you or however you became exposed to sex I would highly recommend going to therapy even just for that basis like there are sex therapists there are people out there who will talk to you about these areas of your life like being exposed to pornography really young maybe having an addiction maybe experiencing some kind of sexual abuse even if you are a couple and you are struggling in the area of sex, there are people who will talk to you and counsel you through that. So allow yourself to even go on that journey in community as well. Like let's take off that veil of shame that exists around sex and sexuality, especially as women, because it will give us the freedom and the liberation that we need to really love ourselves more generally. Um, Yeah, that's what I would say. I wanted to add one thing to that activity you gave as well. I would definitely say make a list of all the things you want to try but have not because you think it's not acceptable. Mm. I'm not just talking about sexual deviance. Yeah, there's that. (laughs) No, I'm talking about like, no, 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 no. I'm talking about like, oh, I really want to try wearing jeans that are this shape, but everyone always says, says that I shouldn't. I remember when I discovered kick flare jeans. Yeah, those I things are great. It. Those things are great, man. I love it, but I always used to think like, oh, they're bootleg, like a, skinny's the, the trend, child, like all of me. that stuff. There is something in my nose that's tickling me and it's really annoying me. It is what it is. Um, mm. I remember discovering them and they became like a huge staple. And every time I go out and somebody com- compliments me on my my boot cart they're not boot carts like my flared jeans yeah my bell bottoms yeah i love it i love it so that's what i mean like even the trivial stuff i want to go on a solo date but i've been scared i want to travel by myself i want to wear a bright pink shirt like i want to do something but i've been scared to do it make a list of it and just tick them off one by one try once once a week do something out of your comfort zone and discover if you like it because you may find that you like it and now Mm. it's going to become a part of your life and that initial fear has been overcome so yeah just trust it out i love that we're gonna put that in the mailing list which i think that you should sign up to by the way just as a reminder in case you listen to this and you forget because there's been some tidbits of great stuff in that yeah the feedback's been amazing can, 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 can confirm um it's very funny because i actually have a friend that's currently holding me accountable to that what does life look like on the other side of fear mm. every single week so how did you overcome your fear yeah. shout out to Steph love you girl <laughs> wow. Steph. Steph you just wonderful my girl ain't she just yeah she's amazing, amazing. sisters we hope you enjoyed that conversation as per usual if you have any thoughts any we would love to hear what you thought about both the episode between Adela and Courtney we've been getting some really great feedback on that so keep it coming, keep it coming. if you enjoyed it yeah. but also your experiences with the male gaze yeah. how you've been divesting your experiences and your relationship with your body and sex yeah. drop it like it's hot in the comments Please below do. over here on YouTube but you can also do it on Spotify as well which is exciting you can do all of that Ooh. and make sure that you are plugged into everything to my sisters that means every social platform at to my sisterhood instagram uh i say every social um platform not snapchat please we're not yet we're not yet <laughs> we're not we're tiktok not. yeah linkedin twitter i mean x follow sorry us. sorry mr Mutz. and of course follow us individually my lovely wonderful articulate bestie on the left here at cd Barteng. and of course come and follow me over at renee kapuku we love to see it sisters have an amazing amazing week let us know what your thoughts are on this topic comment down below Below. we love you so much and we hope that you have a prosperous and healthy thriving week we'll talk to you very very soon and as always keep glowing and growing